Hello, everyone. Today, I'm discussing a hidden cost of COVID. That term may evoke a specific issue in your mind. A hidden cost of COVID could easily refer to the long-term medical consequences for affected patients, the so-called long haulers. It could refer to the mental stress from prolonged social isolation. It could very easily refer to the long-term effects on children who have been attending remote school for the last 12 months. But instead, today I'm discussing an issue that's, that's kind of flying under the radar, but is one which some subscribers to this channel are in a position to do something about. Hospital Visitation Policies. My name is Eric, and I'm a hospitalist, which is an internal medicine doctor who specializes in the care of hospitalized patients. I've been routinely working in the hospital, treating both COVID and non-COVID patients throughout the pandemic. Let me stress that this video is not specifically about my own hospital. What I'm discussing today is playing out in every hospital in the Bay Area and in most hospitals throughout the country. And to be clear, Everything I'm discussing today applies to patients who do not have COVID. Visitations of patients with COVID is more complicated and may be an issue for another day. A quick outline of what I'm going to discuss. The current state of hospital visitation policies. The harm these policies cause. And the arguments in favor of why no visitor policies should remain. I know that good people with good intentions made these policies at a time they seemed prudent and appropriate, but today I hope to convince you that it's time to change them. So let me start with the current state. In short, some hospitals are allowing one or on rare occasions two visitors per hospital stay, while other hospitals do not allow any visitors at any time for any reason outside of a few exceptions. These exceptions vary a little bit, but generally consist of patients who are dying, patients under the age of 18, women in labor, and patients with psychological or development, developmental conditions that prevent safe care without a familiar caregiver at the bedside. For example, a patient with severe autism. Uh, layered on top of these, are, uh, these narrow exceptions, are rules about how many visitors can come, how long they can stay for each visit, and how many visits they can make. These rules are arbitrary and often without any obvious justification. For example, one hospital might say that for an actively dying patient, they are allowed no more than three visitors who can only visit at separate times for no more than 30 minutes each. And if the patient has four children, they can draw straws to see who gets to hug mom one last time and who has to say goodbye over Zoom from the hospital parking lot. This is literally what has been happening. But it can be even worse than this. For example, while there are exceptions for dying patients, how dying is defined can be pretty narrow. A patient on comfort care could be denied visitations by family because a senior hospital employee who has never examined the patient has determined their death was not imminent enough. In other words, instead of the visit occurring when the patient was coherent enough to find the visit meaningful, it only happens after they become incoherent and agonally breathing in their final hours. That becomes their family's memory of their last moments together. That's been the state of hospital visitations in many places since November. Let me discuss the harms from a lack of visitors and this parallels a discussion of what benefits hospital visitors provide to both patients and the medical team. First, and most obviously, visitors provide psychological support. Being acutely ill in an unfamiliar setting is stressful enough as it is. The anxiety increases blood pressure and heart rate, it worsens sleep quality, and worsens the patient's overall sense of well-being. Being isolated without visitors only makes those issues worse. It is particularly hard for non-English speakers who can't even have normal social interactions with their care team, which raises concerns over disparities in care. I personally observed this isolation increase the probability that patients leave against medical advice. Second, visitors, particularly caregivers, can be an invaluable source of information for the medical team. 
they can confirm medical history and medication lists when the patient is confused or otherwise unable to answer questions. You know, while, while yes, this can be done over the phone, what can only be done in person is for the caregiver to give us an idea of how far off their baseline a patient may be. For example, a patient with dementia who presents with confusion, how much of what is seen at the bedside is new versus just a manifestation of their chronic disease? A patient with emphysema who presents with shortness of breath, how much more are they working to breathe than usual? There are no blood tests or x-rays that will tell us this information as well as subjective assessments by their regular caregivers at the bedside, and this impacts clinical decisions, such as, can this patient be safely discharged? Third, visitors help to keep patients oriented and out of delirium. Delirium is a very common problem in the hospital, and despite all efforts to find pharmacological uh, solutions to prevent and treat it, nothing works nearly as well as having a familiar face sit at the patient's bedside every day, talking with them. Delirium doesn't just make the care of the patient more difficult, it's also associated with an increased risk of all kinds of adverse outcomes, from increased length of stay to death. It is much more effective for family to serve as a patient's advocate from the bedside than from the other end of a phone. Caregivers and close family members play an integral role during family meetings, to discuss goals of care and end-of-life decisions. While I've done this over Zoom when necessary, it is so much better to do with all relevant parties together with the patient participating as much as they are able. Last, on the day of discharge, it is invaluable to have the caregiver at the bedside to review discharge meds and instructions. Once again, yes, this can be done over the phone or over Zoom, but it's just not as effective. I mean, how well can a, can a caregiver be taught to use a glucometer or a feeding tube or a pick line over a Zoom call? In short, the harms from not allowing these visitations goes far beyond patients just feeling a little lonely. So what are the arguments in favor of strict policies against hospital visitors during COVID? First, it prevents patients and visitors from spreading COVID to each other. So... I don't know if every U.S. hospital is screening every newly admitted patient for COVID, but certainly many are. While the tests are not 100% sensitive, they're pretty good, and when combined with mandatory mask wearing during recitations and substantially reduced prevalence in the general population right now, the chance that a patient who tests negative for COVID will infect someone visiting them is extremely small. What about visitors giving COVID to patients? It's not practical to test visitors, but they can be screened for symptoms at the door, and again, mask wearing and low community prevalence significantly reduces risk. But in addition to this, most families who want to visit their hospitalized loved ones would probably be routinely seeing them if they were out of the hospital, often because they normally live with them, which means they routinely see them without a mask or symptom screening. So if anything, people are less likely to be infected while in the hospital than they are at home. And for those patients on comfort care measures in which death is expected within a handful of days, them catching COVID is, is not exactly a major concern. In both of these cases, visitors infecting patients and vice versa, it is my overwhelming experience from repeatedly dealing with these situations over the past year that both parties would very quickly agree to accept the small risk that does exist. And that leaves the second argument. It prevents visitors from spreading COVID to staff. This was a very compelling argument three months ago. Given that social distancing among staff is practically impossible in the hospital setting with crowded nurses stations and small team rooms, and there's far more fomites than can be reasonably sanitized after each use, the environment seems prime for an outbreak to occur. And an outbreak among hospital staff could be a catastrophe. But there are two big differences between now and three months ago. First, the community prevalence in almost all parts of the country are a fraction of what they were. Second, all patient-facing, hospital-based employees in the country have had adequate opportunity to receive a highly effective vaccine. When a vaccinated healthcare worker goes to work in the hospital now, 
their chances of catching COVID on any given day is literally less than 1% of what the risk had been a few months ago. I'm not saying we're in the clear or that the pandemic is over, but it's illogical to keep the same policies in place as when there was 100 times greater risk. Another consideration here is the fact that some of the same individuals who are paranoid about getting COVID from patient visitors, uh, these people, they're, they're still eating masks off in the cafeterias and in relatively small shared break rooms around the hospital. You know, they still go gross, grocery shopping, presumably with just a cloth or surgical mask on. They still let their kids attend in-person school where that's an option. You know, also hospitals are still having outpatients enter their building for all kinds of totally non-urgent reasons. Like, why is it a, that a man can't visit his dying wife because she's not technically on comfort care while someone else is down the hall getting their once-a-decade screening colonoscopy? You know, our hospital has had an indoor coffee place open to employees this entire time for the entire pandemic. You know, is your daily mocha latte really more important than a woman being taught how to administer her husband's insulin? You know, I don't think so. And if hospitals were really so concerned about nosocomial spread of COVID, they would make vaccinations and asymptomatic screening mandatory of their employees. And, you know, I'm just going to throw this out there, but another argument apparently against visitors during the pandemic is that some healthcare workers don't seem to want patient visitors, period, irrespective of COVID. To be clear, I do not think things are good enough yet for visitor policies to revert back to what they were pre-COVID, and maybe pre-COVID policies were even too relaxed, particularly with the number of visitors at one time. But the harm is, it's very real from the current arbitrary and non-patient-centered policies. You know, I see this harm play out every single day. A well-known and uh, outspoken oncologist from UCSF, uh, Vinay Prasad, has repeatedly called a no-visitor policy a human rights violation. You know, the first time I heard them say this, it seemed like overly dramatic hyperbole, but I'm more and more convinced that his choice of words is correct. And it's not just patients and their families being affected. Healthcare professionals are experiencing moral injury by needing to negotiate these awful situations and being expected to somehow explain and even defend these policies to families. So what do I think the policies should look like right now? Anyone who lives in the same home as a patient who passes a symptom screen at the front door and who consistently wears a mask in the building should be allowed to visit the patient in their room. A limited number of pe uh, people, particularly at one time, and they can only be in the room, not wandering around the whole unit or the hospital, but no other criteria should be necessary. At least one family member should be allowed to come into the patient's room at the time of discharge to review discharge instructions face-to-face -face with a nurse or doctor, and to ensure that the patient's condition, as represented and understood by the medical team, appears accurate. In other words, to ensure the patient is not being discharged prematurely. Multiple family members and other close support persons should be allowed to attend important in-person bedside family meetings. For dying patients, there should not be an arbitrarily small number of maximum visitors allowed per day, though I would limit those who could see the patient simultaneously to those within the same household unit. And again, everyone needs to be consistently wearing masks and not loitering in hallways. And the last consideration is one I hear almost no one talking about. What about vaccinated visitors? You know, why on earth do we have the same approach to unvaccinated visitors as we do, as we do vaccinated ones? You know, that just, that just doesn't make any sense. People enter a healthcare profession for all kinds of reasons, but at least one of those reasons in each of us should be the desire to relieve suffering. At this point in time in the United States, Easing up visitor policies relieves some of that suffering and, if done judiciously, results in only the most trivial increases in risk to those of us who work in hospitals. As I said near the beginning, I know these policies made a lot more sense at the time they were implemented, but the situation has changed. COVID numbers are much lower across the board, and more importantly, we have a vaccine that all of us should have received. 
One of the overarching problems with the U.S.'s response to COVID is that we've taken too long to change policies and behaviors with changing information. Up until now, this has generally been us not doing enough as things got worse, for example, taking too long to adopt masks. But now, as things are getting better, we are taking too long to do less. It's not too late to fix this, though. And I, I, I would bet that a few people watching this are in a position to do so. So please think it over. Anyway, thanks for watching to the end. And everyone, please stay safe.